um, thank you all for coming. Um, as I just had a chat with one of the parents um, here, and we really wanted to make sure we did this session in person. Um, it's, it's, there's something quite nice and comforting about joining together, um, you know, when we're, we're all feeling lots of emotions. Um, so welcome, my name is Itzik, I'm the um, executive principal of UJEB. Um, very, um, very happy to welcome you to our offices here. Um, also want to acknowledge Simon, Simon's our president is here over there. Um, we have a range of teachers, um, a few teachers around the room as well, and um, parents. Um, this is Chris Chant, he's principal at CJC, so we welcome you to, to UJEB as well, so thank you. Um, look, tonight it's really about um, coping, uh, tools for coping, and, and really focusing on how, you know, tools that we can use to have conversations with young people. And so we had the pleasure of Anat joining us during the week, joining the teachers for um, for some uh, direction in, that, in, in the same topic, and she was really good. Um, and so we really wanted to open this up to the community. Uh, we've got a um, recording here as well, not on you, just on the presentation. Um, so we can also make that available to the community. So I'll let Anna introduce thank herself. Um, and thank you for coming. I'm actually going to be, we've got a group here of, of um, teens, um, both in person and um, virtually on Zoom. So you might hear a bit of a hum in the background. Um, and they're our kids that were, I'll say, are going to Israel in December. We haven't yet made a decision what's happening with that program, but we're trying to help them also through understanding what's happening and how they're feeling and how they can relate to the situation. So Super without fun. any more waffling, thank you very much. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the attendance, you coming in person. Uh, my name is Anat. I'm from Israel. Um, and I am in the process of uh, engaging in my PhD research. My topic, my expertise is climate change. But one of the things that I've learned whilst I was working on my, my PhD research is that there's a lot of things that are embedded in climate change education that relate to education in times of crisis. So how do you give adequate educational uh, answers for someone that is going through something like that is like an earthquake to your life? So an, a life shattering event, something that is, is so profound that you literally can't get your head out of it. How do you meet that educationally? One of the things that we have realized in Haifa University is that um, education is only one tool. We have an entire arsenal of tools. We have psychology, we have community, right? We have advocacy, we have facts, we have questions, we have feelings, okay? What we need right now is to bring a lot of those tools together and create some sort of a multidisciplinary answer for our children, for our students, and for our staff. Because the situation is, is very, the situation does, it doesn't just involve education. It doesn't just involve facts. We don't just need to give them a hug. We don't just need to put them in front of the TV for them to watch the news. We need an arsenal of tools that are coming from a different range of disciplines. So that's what we're gonna do right now. Check out the whiteboard behind me. It will make sense in a second, I promise. Right now, it doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, so we're gonna start from the beginning. How are you feeling today? Okay, who here feels something like this? I, I don't, I, 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 I don't, I, it was, I saw, I, I just can't, I, who here feels this? Okay, um, so combination of a lot of things and you don't know exactly what it is. You can't put your finger on it. It's grief, but it's also chaos. It's also what we call balagan, right? Um, sadness, but fear as well, but also kind of like, uh, you feel stiff, like you're ready to leap out. You're ready to be called to action. You want to do something, but you're paralyzed all at the same time. Yes? So what we're feeling, all of us, is a kind of like a, a rainbow of emotions almost. Like we have this, this feeling of we are experiencing a broad spectrum of stuff and we're experiencing all at once. Okay? So everything from pride and the sense of belonging and our Zionism all of a sudden is popping out there, like right, lifting up its head all the way through to hatred, right? From love to hatred, from fear to pride to courage. We have it all in us. All of this range of emotion. We also have 
uh, younger kids might be feeling something like that is very similar to uh, an action movie or a video game. There's the baddies and there's the goodies and there's something a little bit maybe exciting about it. It's exhilarating. We have a, we have a quite a big spectrum of emotions. Every single one of them is 100% normal because what characterizes a time of crisis is the inability to anticipate what is going to happen. And that puts us, evolutionary speaking, purely our hormones, puts us in some sort of a state of paralysis. So that is this chaos that you're feeling right now, this balagan that you're feeling. So it's really normal. However, there's a catch. As normal as it is, I would love to validate what you're feeling and tap on your shoulder, maybe give you a good hug. And I would love to tell you, oh, it's all okay, you can feel that. But you don't, you don't have that privilege. Why? Because you are educators, because you are parents, because you have responsibilities, because you are the gatekeepers of your community. You are standing in front of other people and you need to give them an answer. And for them to be able to get the best out of you, you need to take care of yourselves first. Okay? So this spectrum of emotion or this rainbow of responses to the situation, we are going to see in 100% of our kids, we're going to see pretty much all of this, this spectrum. I'm gonna quickly give you a quick guidelines on how to catalog those kids, on how to, when you see a kid, and you're hearing them, how do you, what do you make of it? What are you looking for? So basically and very broadly speaking, we're talking about two types of kids. Okay, the, the very typical clear type. We have the thinkers, that will be our Y axis, and we have the feelers, that will be our X axis, okay? So the feelers would be kids that either care immensely or don't care at all. So this would be the care axis, and this would be the no, K-N-O-W. We have kids that know a lot of facts, okay? I learned. We have kids that know a lot. They're very bright, they're very intelligent. They know the, the, the history of the state of Israel and they know exactly what Hamas is. And they know who the Palestinians are and they would have a lot of questions and they would be very curious. They would be up here, right? So they would know a lot. And we have the kids that care. So they really love the IDF and they really love Israel and they would choose to put on their white and blue shirt and they, they feel something very strong doesn't necessarily mean the carers don't necessarily know and the knowers don't necessarily care. So very broadly speaking, I'm gonna give you four types of you know, uh, typical children's respond to this time. So we have this kid here. He is the thinker and the carer, okay? So that is a child that both is very curious, he wants to know things, but he also really cares. He really, it, it, it's, it's the sense of belonging. He feels like this is happening to his family. And that kid would probably be both in distress because, because of how much they care and in a very big thirst for knowledge. Okay, so that's the thinker and the carer. We would have here a carer, but not a thinker. So that would be a child that really cares and really wants to do something, but they have no idea what's going on. They're not very into the terminology, maybe someone that isn't that curious about facts, but they really, really care and they really want to find themselves engaged and involved. We have the thinker that doesn't care. So it will be very smart, human, a very smart, intelligent, bright child, maybe very curious about the fact, but they don't really seem to be portraying any emotional connection to the situation. Maybe they wouldn't be uh, involved in the question of how are other people feeling. They wouldn't be feeling emotional distress. It'll just be, I want to know more things. Bright eye open, questions being asked. They need to know more facts. They would be Googling, looking at the news and the TV a lot. And the last one is the don't know, don't care. Okay? Right, you all know every single one of those types of children. You know the ones that care, but they don't seem to be understanding the full picture of it. And you know the ones that are completely shut out of it, maybe even alienated. Okay. So every single one of those children really just gets a different type of educational and psychological response. The carers would be the ones that we're working with emotions here, right? We're working with vulner emotional vulnerability, emotional instability. That's the kids that we're working with that will be susceptible to 
to PTSD and stress and trauma later down the road, okay? So it would be those ones. And those two kids, the thinkers, we are looking at children that what they need right now is that intellectual stimulation. They need to make sense. They're the sense makers, right? If something doesn't make sense to them, that would be their source of distress, okay? It's actually, it's interesting because to me, it kind of, it's really parallel to the four sons in the Haggadah in Pesach. It's, it's actually very much is because we have the smart, the Ben Chacham, the smart son. He is affiliated. It's his story. So he needs to know more. So we need to challenge him. We need to challenge him via connection. This is yours. And I'm challenging you to understand more from a place of ownership. This is your people. So that's this person, the carer and the thinker. This one, also very smart, but he doesn't care. It's sort of like the Ben Rasha, the evil son. So this isn't mine. I don't feel like I'm a part of this. This is not necessarily my story. I want to know more. It's kind of like a referee in soccer, right? That's the Ben Rasha. What do we say to him? We present to him with the facts. We try to challenge him intellectually, and we leave it at that. We don't try to challenge their sense of belongings, not at this point. There will be other times and other tools for this. This one, the carer, but not the thinker, is the tam, right? It's the innocent, is the, the naive, maybe even younger children are very typically here, the carers, but not the thinkers. To them, we would say exactly what the Haggadah says to us, that we need to say to the benatam. The Aliyev is strong. We got this. You should be proud. You have a strong people. Our people is a, are a strong people. Okay? So we don't get into details. Details are the thing that might would, would get this kid in distress. So we're just basically sticking to reassuring, empowering statements. Okay? With this son. And the last son, the, think, the non-thinker and the non-feeler, someone that maybe is a little bit alienated to the situation, I'm going to leave that up to you educators, whether or not you want to bring them in, offer to them to participate, offer to them the perception that this is their people and therefore they should care, or just tell yourselves, I have one less child to worry about their future PTSD. Okay? So this child is the one that doesn't know how to ask. He's just completely shut off of this. 90% of your kids, 90% of your students would fall somewhere into this matrix of knowing and caring, okay? Um, a good job for an educator and or a parent is to try to figure out where my kids fit into there. Are they carers or are they givers? And then the, the educational made the immediate respond for that would be accordingly. If your son care, you need to take care of their emotions. If your, th your son or daughter knows, you need to take care of their intellect. You need to take care of their sense-making mechanisms. If they're both, then both. If they're none, then none. Broadly speaking, your job in their lives is sort of to anchor them down to reality. Okay, so a child has a few anchors in their lives, okay? They have their community. They have their peers. They have their teachers or their school. Maybe they have the youth movements. Yeah, they have, and they have their parents, obviously. Those factors in a child's life are responsible for keeping that child connected to the ground. That's you guys. That's your job. That is the reason why you have to get your act together before you start talking to your child, because you have a job. Your job is to anchor your students, your community, and your child. Okay, that job would take a lot. I saw a caricature today that passed through Facebook. It, it, the title was uh, for all of you mothers that think that you're well, wasting your time just spending being at home with your children. You see the mother standing in front of the child and behind her are demons, black hands, demons, nightmares trying to reach out for her child. And the mother is literally standing in front of her daughter, protecting her with her body. It was a very powerful image, and to me, it's the epitome of our job as parents at this time. We need to help our children to make sense out of this whole situation and get out of this situation with stronger children, stronger community resilience, 
more sense into reality, more anchored children, children that are more connected to the ground, more connected to their people. So that's our job. For us to be able to do this job, I'm going to give you today five tools from multiple disciplines that will help you to meet that goal in the very best way, to be the very best version of the educator that you are. So the first thing is what I would like to call navigating the ship. Imagine that you are a ship and that that ship is stuck in the middle of a storm and you have no idea what's going on. You don't know where you're aiming. So what happens to you? You are being led out by that storm. So if that storm takes you west, you go west. If that storm takes you east, you go east. What does it look like in real life? You watch your phone and you watch TV. And if the TV has horrible images, then you are in a horrible mood. And if the TV, the, your phone has some reinforcing stuff, some good news, then you, you, get a, you get a breath of fresh air. And if you get a phone call from someone, then they're telling you something very distressful, then you absolutely lose your ability to function. And if someone else tells you something else, then you go this way. And if someone tells you this way, then you are very, very susceptible to being led by whatever comes. Sort of like a sense of helplessness, kind of losing control over ourselves. I felt that in the first 48 hours, I was in this, that situation. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Every single time I looked at the phone, this is where the wind took me. I, they said that they need a donation. Okay, I'm going to do donation. I heard this a catchphrase that someone in the government just said, this is what I believe now. I believe that it must be true. Right? Do you get that? Do you get the feeling that sometimes you're being led by a storm of things happening and you have no control over it? Imagine a child. Imagine a child in the middle of this. They have no control over what is happening to them, to their personalities, what is how their, them as, a, as human beings are being shaped at this critical time. So we need to take control over the ship. We need to start navigating. Here's a good way to do that. A good way to navigate the ship in terms of we have our children with us on the ship, right? If you're a teacher, you have your class with you on the ship. If you're a principal, you have your school with you on the ship. Now you need to navigate. A really good way of doing that is to name emotions. Naming emotions. Here's what it looks like. If your child is coming to you if, or if a student or a staff member or friend they're coming to you and they're giving you the sense of, I, I, I don't, I have, I saw on Facebook and the TV was, and I, then I turned up. If this is what you're getting, a really good trick to anchor them down, filling your role as their anchor, the anchor in their lives would be to start telling them the names of the emotions that they're feeling. So it would look like this. I would be, I would be talking to Dana. Dana would tell me, oh, Anat, I, I just don't know what's going on. I'm so confused. And, a good way to meet that would be, oh, Dana, I can see that you're really distressed. I feel that you're absolutely confused. That makes a lot of sense. This is a very, a very hard time for all of us. We're all feeling absolutely in chaos right now. Okay? So in two sentences, I gave Dana three different words that would name her emotions. Here's what happens. Here's the beautiful magic that's happening right now inside of our bodies. We have a hormone called cortisol. And that hormone is activating our endocrine system and it's activating um, stress and it's provoking anxiety. What happens is this is evolutionary, shutting down our um, neurological system, our nervous system. And it's making it literally harder for us to make conscious decisions based on future perception based on knowing what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to break it down. If I'm feeling distressed and I'm having a release of cortisol in my body or adrenaline, right? In my body, I cannot think about the future of my children. I cannot plan for them. I cannot educate them. Education being taking them from here to there. I cannot do that. Naming our emotions is actually a way to overpass the endocrine system and doing a little nice little bypass of our brain 
over our emotions. If you try that on a three-year-old, four-year-old, you will literally see magic happening right in front of your eyes. If a child goes through a tantrum because someone else took their toy, if you sat them down, looked at them in the eyes, and you would tell them, oh, you must be very frustrated right now. I would be very angry if someone else took my toy. My toy. I would feel so helpless. I would even be a little bit, a little bit disappointed at them. Here's what you'll see. You'll see that child, he wouldn't look at you in the eyes. He, his, his eyes would be wondering, and he would just say, yeah, yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I'm frustrated. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's how you know you got it right, okay? It's magic. I love it. I do that to my daughter all the time, and I feel like a wizard. It's amazing. Because what happens be when, when I tell her what she's feeling, I'm actually helping to anchor her down define what she's feeling and i'm helping her to be able to make a decision that she can then navigate her own choices does that make sense okay it works on teenagers too and adults it works on adults as well think about yourselves in that situation think about yourselves in a situation that you are feeling completely helpless and someone looks at you in the eyes and tell you what you're feeling so number one you're safe right? You're in a safe space. You're in a space where someone understands you. So you all of a sudden, immediately, you are feeling anchored down. And that person is your anchor <laughs> right now. You have, you feel a little bit more grounded and a little bit more safe. And the, yeah. Oh, you're saying that maybe a child wouldn't appreciate the fact that you are telling them how you're feeling. This, yeah, that would be a, another way of putting it. If I was a teacher, I would probably put it in a more sensitive way than this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the point of, the, of this in the conversation is not to manipulate someone else into, you know, this is what you're feeling. Let me hypnotize you and tell you what you're feeling. The purpose of it really is for you to actually, the, the process of sense making, right, as the mechanism that overtakes that chaos of emotions. Sense making is a very powerful tool and it helps us when we're angry and anger takes over our judgment or when we're hating someone so much that we can't think clearly. Sense making is just a mechanism. However you want to phrase it, it if it still works as a sense maker to the person that you're talking to, you, you got this. It doesn't matter what how you phrase it. The way that I like to do it and I feel is also as sensitive as you would like it to be, is I try to casually integrate it into the conversation. And I also try to talk about myself. I, I would feel absolutely outraged if that happened to me uh, because now we're on the same boat, literally. I'm navigating together with you and I'm showing you what I would do if it was me in this storm. And that's how I'm navigating that kid back into shore, okay? On the long term, it releases oxytocin, which is the hormone of trust, which means that that kid would now trust you more. And in the short term, it creates that safe space for the child to acknowledge their own feelings in a place that they're not being judged in. Okay. So we're taking that kid from a position where their mind looks like this, right? A kind of like a one big balagan. And we're starting to kind of like imagine that I'm taking out those threads one by one and I'm putting them in a straight line, right? So I'm telling that kid, let me help you to make sense of this. Here, what, you, what you're feeling? You're feeling sad, okay? But you're also feeling, it's a little bit more than sad. There's a fine, little fine tone to sadness, which is distressed. It's like sad that is helpless, right? It's, a, it's like another, so we have distress. Okay, we have helpless, right? Because if your child is a carer and they don't know what to do, then they are feeling helpless, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, scared, right, absolutely. Scared. Yeah. So you're asking what to say to the child. So right now we're still navigating that boat into safety, okay? What you say to a child that is obviously very scared and has horror movies literally in his head and on repeat, you say to them, you look at them in the eyes, preferably with a, a touch, if, that, if possible, like hold their hands. And you say to them, oh, I, I can see that. I can really feel how scared you are. It is scary, isn't it? So what you want to do is not just name those emotions, but also validate them, right? You want to explain to them that some, they're somewhere here, aren't they? They're somewhere on that spectrum of normal emotions, you know? Is that what they want? What, what do the kids want when they come to you? Do, you? do they want you to fix it? Think about you and your mom. Let's do an exercise for a second. <laughs> if you have a problem, do you go to your loved one and expect, if you, you share a problem, you expect them to immediately, here, I know what to do. I'll fix it for you. Yeah? What else? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. You want validation. A child coming to you in distress, first thing they want, before you fix anything, before you do your mommy wizard thing that fixes everything, they want you to validate the fact that you understand them. Um, the, uh, there's a, a system called uh, nonviolent communication. It's a, it's, a, it's a psychological system of parenting. And one of the main rules of it is that there's an equation going on in a child's head. And it, it has nothing to do with what culture they're from or how, it's basically until the age of four. The following equation goes on in their head. If my mom understands me, then she loves me. And if she loves me, then I'm not alone. If my mom doesn't understand me, it means that she doesn't love me. If she doesn't love me, that means that I'm alone. And if I'm alone, then my life is in danger. Okay. I'm not safe. Okay. So that equation exists on 100% of homo sapiens babies, regardless of their culture or religion or whatever. I would say even more so with Jewish babies, isn't it? They would probably feel even more so because they see, they know what an anxious mom is when they see it. So they, when a child comes to you, first thing that they want, evolutionary speak, speaking, is I want you to understand me so that I know that I'm loved, so that I know that I'm safe. Okay, so validation isn't just something that we do to manipulate the child and then we'll figure it out for them. It's not something that you can bypass. There are no shortcuts for validation of a, a child's emotions. You have to go through with that, especially in times of crisis. You have to validate their, their emotions. Solving their problem, you, don't, you, you can't solve fear. And I'm not sure that I would want you to either. Fear means that your child understands the world, understands it clearly, it means that the, your, your child is a carer and a thinker, and it means that they're not alienated to their own people. That's what fear means to me. The question is, what do you do one step afterwards? How do you care for your son's or daughter's soul and being later down the road? How do you stop that from becoming a trauma? And we'll get to that in a second, okay? So the spectrum of feelings is enormous. If I continued on with this, I would probably make a list of at least 100 different feelings. The more accurate you are with the precise emotion that your son or your student are feeling or your staff member, the quicker they would feel validated and the quicker you would navigate them into safely. The quicker their brain would start making sense of the world again. Okay? So if uh, someone's feeling kind of like an interesting combination of helplessness because I want to help, but also feared, fear for my loved ones because I remember my cousin and my cousin is too close to the border right now. So it's sort of like, um, it's not exactly sadness. You can't call this sadness. You have to call it by its precise name. So they're feeling maybe uh, frustrated for some sort of frustration. It's like, oh, I really want to help. And I, I'm, oh, I really, I wish that everything was better. Um, right? And Helplessness, yeah, that, that would be a good word for it. So you have to be very precise. Think about your kids, think about your students, think about yourselves. Try as an exercise for yourself, it will help you a lot, I promise. 
try to list 10 things that you're feeling. Don't say sad. Right. Just try to find that fine, you know, color of the rainbow exactly that you're feeling. Kind of like, you know how there's salmon pink and there's fuchs, fuchsia pink? Yeah. <laughs> and it's not the same pink, is it? It's different pinks. Flower pink. Kylie pink. Apparently that's a thing now. Try to find exactly the shade of your emotion. Okay? Do 10 of those and see how you feel after you do this exercise. Okay. If you do this as an educator, it will be a hell of a lot easier for you to do that to the students and the children that you're responsible for. Okay. Because all of a sudden you will understand what it means that the neurological system is taking over the endocrine system. You will understand what sense making means and it will be easier for you to navigate other people to safety, to shore. Okay. So a list of emotions. I literally asked ChatGPT the other day. I asked him, please give me a list of every single bad emotion in, that humans have ever felt. Pew. I got like 120. And then I was like, oh yeah, that's what I'm feeling. Oh my God, I, I didn't even think about that. So it's a very helpful exercise. Google would be good at that, ChatGPT. You know, just brainstorming uh, with your staff. All of those could work. The point of this exercise is to show you that if your brain is not in control, right? If your cortex is not the one doing your thinking, but your emotions are, then you are drifted by the storm. You are not navigating your life, okay? And we all know, everyone that has been seeing, watching the TV, we know the difference between a victim and a hero. A victim, life happens to you. A hero, you happen to life, okay? So you want to be navigating. You don't want to let yourself be drifted away. So we got this. On that topic of navigating our emotions, I want to tell you uh, about the slippery slope that every single, probably every single Jewish child to teenager, also maybe uh, young adults, is facing right now. This is us uh, just about to fall into the slippery slope of watching horror videos on social media, okay? This is some, I'm, I'm sure you've heard this already. Do not let your kids stay in front of the TV for hours. Don't let them watch the videos of the people taking into Gaza. Don't let them watch videos of dead bodies. Do not let them. It's snuff, it's distressing, and it stays with you. And what happens with those images is that no, amount of love in the world would ever be able to take those images out of your son's head or in your daughter's head. If they sink down into that rabbit hole of videos and images and you know there's recordings of people screaming, <clears throat> there's no going back from there. So if you haven't done so until now, sit your child down and tell them, I want you to stop watching those videos. Okay, I want you to tell them, I want you to tell that to your staff, tell that to your young children, physically turn off the TV if needs be and stick to only reliable news sources. Because what happens is obviously the social media, we're in an era of information and an era of information has a lot of things and they are measured not by their reliability or how good they are to you. They are measured by how many views they would get. So the algorithm, is putting it in the simple words, evil, right? Because it will give me the thing that I wouldn't be able to take my, my, my eyes off of. That's what the algorithm would give you of social media. So that would be being in a storm times a hundred because you can't talk your way out of it. You can't explain to the algorithm, can I please have only reliable, can you filter out the fake news, please? Can you filter out the lies? Can you filter out? the bad sites, that's, that's not an option, okay? Once you've, seen it, you can't unsee it. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. So what happens is that this is a very, very, very slippery slope. You don't know exactly what would be the one image that would stay in your daughter's heart or your son's heart. You don't know what would be the, the sounds that she would hear that will get her to not be able to shut her eyes. You don't know what would be the thing that would trigger nightmares. Um, 
in it's it, 50 years ago in Milhamed Yom Kippur, they reported a massive percentage of children that kept, went back to weeing in bed after the age of five. So children that were already uh, withdrawn for nappies, um, you know, hearing stories, hearing their parents telling the stories about what happened in Yom Kippur, October the 7th, by the way, 1973, exactly the same day, 50 years ago. Um, and those children hearing their parents talking or hearing their educators telling them stuff that have been happening, uh, had nightmares, they had bad sleeps, um, a lot of PTSD that later reincarnated into uh, adulthood, a lot of children going back to wedding to bed. You don't know exactly where it's going to hit which child. It's not exact science. It's really important. So if you're, your job is to be the anchor, right, in the child's life, here's what an anchor does. It does this. Turning off the TV. Stop watching social media. Please let me explain to you why. You're old enough to understand, you 10 year old, you 12 year old, right? You're old enough to understand, so I'm gonna tell it to you as it is. Those things will really make you feel bad. You cannot unsee them once you see them and I trust you to make the right decision. Let's do that together. I'm your mom, I'm here to help you to navigate through this. I know you're going through, I know you want to know. I know you, you care, right? I know you, you want to know, you're curious and you wanna know more and that's why you're on social media. I want to validate that with you. I'm proud of you for being so curious. I want you to know that this is not the way. Please do not be afraid to be strict on that particular matter. Because what happens is, yeah, go ahead. Right. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. And it will start showing him even more extreme videos because there you go. Here's a good consumer for that. We can probably sell more commercials now through that uh, child. So yes, um, they will target uh, your kid's peers and they will give him more of the same thing. So it's it's literally just an artificial intelligence. There's no human thought behind this. There's no censorship, right. There, there is, there's no trigger warning. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's also important to note that, that most of the footage is taken by Hamas. Yes. Most of the footage is taken to specific purpose. Yes, to horrify you. Yeah. That's true. And they're the ones that are connected to social media. Mm -hmm. So honesty is a piece about why it's there at the same time as asking them not to look at Beautiful. It. Thank it you. It's extremely important. Yeah, absolutely. So a terror organization is called a terror organization because their goal is to terrorize. They want to destabilize uh, our lives in Israel. They want to make our lives as hard as possible. So watching those videos, in a sense, would be exactly falling into their tricks. Yeah, go ahead. What is it called? An apt APT? I love Stephen King. Never heard of it. Thank you. Um, older kids. Okay. Um, okay, so... What we really want to do is we want to stop that falling into the slippery slope, okay? We don't want our children to go there. What waits for them down here is two things in particular, three things in particular. Um, if they really, really go down there, they have PTSD waiting for them with all of its symptoms and all of how complicated it is to reverse PTSD. There's also depression um, or indifference so lack of emotions, like complete darkness inside. So I've seen so many things that I literally cannot cope with it. So it's a shutdown um, of, of emotions. It's darkness, it's really, it's really sad. And the third thing is hatred, right? None of those scenarios is good for your child. There is no happiness at the end of this. There are no good things 
waiting for your child if they see a lot of videos and know a lot. Some people might say, yes, but we want the world to see those sites and we want the world to know. We want the world, yes, but not your children, okay? Yeah. So the truth is that there's only so much that you can do because you're right. Kids are uh, way too. This is it's way too easy. It's the same question goes with. Sorry, everyone. It's the same question goes for pornography. How do you actually stop them? I believe in a very direct approach to this. Um, you need to establish some sort of a trust link between you and your child on that particular matter and you need to be able for to to kind of like see in your child's eyes that you that you are being heard at the very least what you're doing right now education i'm afraid is not a an action that is kind of like a clear-cut action education is like a seed that you plant i want you to at the very least even if you're feeling helpless as a parent at the very least try to plant in your son's head the seed that this is a very irresponsible, reckless behavior, okay? This is something that ma makes him distressed and something that images that maybe he's not going to be able to shut off. Um, and I'm going to be very level with you. On the other hand, some kids are able to see those images and it doesn't cause them distress. And that could be an argument that your kid pulls out against you. He's going to say, nah, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm very strict on every child that I have anything to do with to explain to them how bad it is for their souls and to ask them to understand that this is something that they need to be responsible for themselves. The older the kid is, the easier it is for you to tell them, this is your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Um, but even if you're feeling that at the end of this conversation, you are going to lose the battle, it's still worth having it. That's how education works, I'm afraid. Okay, and we're also, um, we're gonna move to here. So the slippery slope is absolutely devastating. So now we know what not to, what, what not to let them do or what not to say. We're not gonna tell them horrific things. We're not gonna tell them about people being abducted. We're not gonna tell them about the children. We're not gonna do any of those things. So what, yes, what are we going to tell them? So let's define the framework of ourselves for a second. We need reliable messages responsible, positive, that are also truthful, because we're, we're not allowed to lie as educators. So we're not allowed to manipulate. We have to be straightforward and it has to encompass in it our trust in them and also the fact that we believe that we all belong to the Jewish people. So what would be some of those messages? We're gonna brainstorm on this together. Help me out here. What is a good, positive, strengthening empowering message that we can tell our children okay so number one you are safe does anybody have a problem with this message what's the problem with this message oh okay so you're saying maybe they're not safe so how would i how would I know? Is that what you're saying? What else is, what is in the context of the war going on in Israel? What, what's going on with this message? When you hear it, what is it immediately? The next sentence is, sorry? Yes, exactly. Yes. So here's how a message works, okay? Here are the words, you are safe. Let's say that's the message that I want to convey to my daughter. My, there's there's epistemol ontologically speaking right the words revolve around the words there's also another sentence that is being said here that is not being said and that other sentence is but they are not safe okay so that message whilst i want to give her a feeling that she's safe right now the, this message as it is is a bit problematic and it's not meeting the need for our children to not just feel that they're safe but to also to feel that the people that they love are safe or their people are safe, okay? How would we otherwise say it? So it wouldn't be you are safe. 
I also can't say we are all safe because that's a lie and we're not allowed to lie. So what can I say? Yeah. Sorry. So. The people in your life are trying to keep you safe. Do you think that it answers what we just said that the underline is, but the people in Israel are not safe? Oh, okay. So what you're doing is you're creating some sort of uh, they are safe because of the IDF and we are safe because we live in Australia. Okay, let's work with that. Okay, so they have the IDF and we're here. Is that a message? Is that educational, positive, empowering? Does that meet all of our requirements? Okay, let's let's keep let's keep thinking. What could be a good message here? Okay. Let's try to see if that works for us. So the Jewish people are strong. Sorry about the Balagan people. Are strong. The Jewish people are strong. Good message. Is that a lie? Is that empowering? Does that meet our need for them to feel safe, but also not to feel like they, their, their loved ones are in danger? But are they not strong? <laughs> okay. So how would we otherwise phrase this? Because the word strong, I like. The word strong is spot on. Okay, I'm going to write this as another message. We support each other. We support each other. Okay. Um, something along the lines of our community. Um, works together. Um, yes, beautiful. We've all got the same interests at heart for to keep people each other strong and safe and support each other together. Whether we're here. So there's whether... there's a beautiful one word for everything you just said. One word. It's we. Right. So instead of the Jewish people are strong and we support them, there's, there's, there's one collective and it's called a we, okay? Let me tell you how that meets your concern, which I totally understand. Your concern is that maybe it's, it's not 100% the, the truth because sometimes people are not strong enough. Sometimes we lose, sometimes people die. Something horrible happened, sometimes, yeah. We, the, the message we are strong, oh, terrible. We, oh my God. We are strong. Okay. So we're gonna do a little bit of, um, um, how do you call it? How do you, how do you call a media design, message designing, propaganda, um, copywriting, yes. We are strong, okay. So we, it encompasses inside of it the thought that we, us and them, Australian Jewish jury and Israeli uh, jury, it's, it's one collective. We're actually saying I'm strong and you're strong with child, so we're including them in the Yeah, here we are on the same boat together, right? And we're, we're navigating through together. the storm together. together, yeah. We are strong is reassuring, right? It doesn't mean that people are not being hurt. It, People are being hurt, but we are a bigger collective than that in that individual that is being hurt. Yes, that person's being hurt, but guess what? There's still more we, and we're going to support that person that was hurt. There is grieving, but guess what? We're still strong. Okay. That's it's actually not a lie. I don't want to get into technical difficult uh, technical um, aspects of yeah, Dana.
I think all of the good and strong things in us might come back. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I watched. I don't actually look at the material as art, but there's some um, reserved soldiers just posting mm -hmm. they're there. They, they say, stop sending us food. We're eating too much. <laughs> we don't like the, the Ashkenazi cooking. Please stop it. And I talked to my friends back home. They've all opened their houses. They're waiting for food. For people to eat. Food. I told them they could leave. They're homeless. It's, it just happened so quickly. And it, I think it's time to move the focus there. And maybe, yeah, maybe if we start watching all those, that's the algorithm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not a teaser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's gonna. So I think the we is, the, and we are strong. Yes, as a nation, as a people, we are strong. Um, and we have been sick before. And it is, yeah. The way to make it. How do you know? How old is the child asking the question? 13 and 16. So you can actually give a proper answer. I remember asking myself that question before my Poland trip. Why us? There's two answers to this. Um, the, the first question is that uh, the first answer, well, 13 and 16 deserve a proper answer, S historic, philosophical, right? The first answer is that um, Jewish people, it's, it's absolutely not new. Anti-Semitism is actually a very, very ancient thing. It dates back to before the year zero. Um, the first anti-Semitist, uh, anti-Semitism uh, ever, piece of anti-Semitism I've ever written, it's called Epion, and it was in the year 200 before, um, before zero, BC, right? And it's talking about how the Jewish people are only loyal to that king and not to our king, and how they don't work on Shabbat, so they cost us money. So it dates back to, and how an idea becomes, uh, just sort of like submerges under the ground and then pops up in different situations in history. That is a fascinating topic to, to, to talk about, probably deserves its own lecture. But I think that your kids deserve a proper answer. That's what I'm saying. They don't deserve a brush it off the table answer. Anti-Semitism is something that exists in the world and it's probably never going away. And it's kind of like, imagine that you're standing on the ground and you don't know what's happening on the ground. Under the ground, there's a monster sleeping. That monster has a lot of heads. Every once in a while, it, one of the heads wake up and it pops up and then everybody's fighting this head and it's not okay and whew, we think we're done with this and then somewhere else in the world that monster pops its head back up again it's just the thing that exists so yes yeah, that's the second answer. The second answer is there's not just hatred against Jewish people. There's hatred against every type of people. There isn't a people living a life today. There isn't one person alive today that doesn't have someone else hating them just because of who they're born to be. It doesn't exist. No matter what skin color you have, someone hates you somewhere. Okay, no matter what gender you are, no matter what your sexual orientation, someone hates you for it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. I 100% I agree with you. I would also equalize it with, on the other hand, anti-Semitism is really, is really um, a very distinct form of, of bigotry that we know has history, it has philosophy, it has, you know, it's a monster with different types of heads. It has its own, you know, uh, logical failures, right? For example, in Germany, Jewish people were uh, accused of being social, the socialist pigs and the capitalist pigs at the same time, by the same propaganda, by the same people. So if you were a capitalist, you would hate them for being socialist. And if you're a socialist, you would hate them for being capitalist, right? So anti-Semitism makes inner sense to people that need to hate. So there's, there's a lot in that. 
what I'm saying is that I would really sit down and give a complex and uh, a good answer. Because obviously, your kids are thinkers and carers. Otherwise, they wouldn't ask. Okay, that's a question that is very typical for a thinker and a carer. Okay, so we have we are strong. Okay, so that's one message. We want to we want to convey that message. We want to convey it firmly. We want to be convincing. Okay, so when we come to a child and we tell him any type of variation of we are strong, it can be the IDF is one of the strongest armies in the world. It's not it's not a lie, right? Um, there's no precedent in history almost for a terror organization defeating a well prepared army. So they're not going to win, not according to known history, they're not going to win. We have had plenty of wars before and we prevailed every single one of them. Okay. So all of those are variations of the message we are strong. Okay. Diaspora Jewry, did you know that there's 20 million Jewish people around the world and all of them are right now, you know, they stopped their routine and they're all getting together to support Israel? Yeah, go ahead. Beautiful. Wait, what did he say in Israeli? I'm curious. Lift up. <laughs> Lift up ourselves. Of course, that's what an Israeli would say. Wait, we have to we have to look forward. Okay, so we will bring them home. Again, I love that as a message. It's definitely like a good advocacy message or something that I would put on social media. I wouldn't say that to a child uh, because um, if someone doesn't come back home, which is very likely to happen, that child would feel a little, there's gonna be a little breach of trust there. So that message is really good for social media. It's really good for collectives. It's not good for an individual to individual conversation, okay? But we do have, we have to look forward. Beautiful, I love that. We have to, we have to. We've always had to, we're going to have to look forward for the rest of our lives. We, this, I, I feel like um, some of the things that you said are kind of like a direct branch of we are strong. So we are strong is quite a, a fertile message. It has a lot of branches to it. We are strong, we are one people, we support each other, we will win, we will prevail eventually. Um, we, we have always won, right? It's all kind of like branches of the same message. So once you take that message and you start rephrasing it in all kinds of ways, using all kinds of words from your dictionary, right? At the end of the day, the core of your message becomes more and more and more and more and more coherent and understandable and conveyable. We are strong. It's a beautiful message. It's very infectious. It's very hard. It's very hard to miss. It's very easy to grasp, very easy to understand. It's very easy to, it's very uplifting. And it's not, it's not a lie. We also have the support of a lot of other. Yes, there you go. So we have, there you go. Thank you, Dana. We have the we, okay? But we also have other support rings around us, right? I don't know if you've been to the Coalfield um, Shul, uh, the congregation that, the vice president of the Australian Federation stood up on stage with a yarmulke on his head and he said, Australia is undividedly supporting Israel right now. We will be with our friends in this hard time and we will support you. And he got massive applause and everyone, I felt it. I felt like this, thank you, amazing. So, so it's not that just we support each other is kind of like a direct link of we are strong, but we, Yes, we are. Yeah, sure. I'm going to repeat maybe the question yeah. after. Her daughter is 10. Beautiful. Intuitive. It's intuitive, isn't it? I think so. However, we're having this conversation on Sunday night. We were away from something. We were lying in the same bedroom. 
um, she said, promise me, Lana. Promise me you'll do this. Beautiful. So, and, and I said to her, well, I promise you. I promised her. <gasps> okay. That, that, that you would say. What is it? Audience, is that the right thing to say? I promise you everything's going to be okay. Well, it depends what you consider okay. Some people it's a very high bar. Beautiful. And for others, it's like, you know, what is it being okay? For Ellie, who I know, being okay is being loved by her mum and told that, yes, we will be, hmm. whatever that looks like. Right. Okay. Here's, here's the, the two answers. We have the we, the Jewish people, okay, and the state of Israel. It's a collective. You promised her that the we is going to be okay. You didn't lie to her. We will be. I promise you that now. We will be okay. Because we've done this before and it happened to us before and we've always won. And there's no way in the world that being supported as we are by the United States, the UK, France, and Australia, there is no scenario of us losing. So you didn't lie. But inside this collective, there are dots, right? I don't know if this dot is going to be okay. I cannot promise you that. I can't make that promise. Go ahead, challenge, challenge us. I don't know if it's like I don't know if it's as simple as winning and losing or just surviving. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll survive and, and we'll get through it. But I, I don't know if it's a problem of, of what is the you know what is yeah. the moment. So what are the technicalities of win or lose? So let let me phrase it in the way that I, I tell all my, my staff and my children and everyone that I work with. Um so you're asking the question of what will be the price that we pay? Because for us, oh, okay, in that matter. Well, I don't want to get technical, but a war is a legal situation, right? It has inter there's international law that now applies on that area of Palestine and Israel. Winning or losing is a very binary dichotomy situation. There is the winner and then there's is the loser. Um, the problem with the situation in Palestine is that Hamas is not defined legally per se as a military body because it's a terror organization. So it's not recognized by anyone. So it's silly to say, but technically we can't lose because we're not fighting against an army. But legally speaking, there is such a thing as victory or loss because there are objectives. Are we meeting those objectives or are we not? Those objectives could be um, you know, just like collective objectives of restoring control over the settlements of Utef Aza, for example, okay? Uh, it will be uh, enabling routine to go back and living the uh, education system to go back into action and for children to go to schools. It will be going back to routine. So um, there's a lot of technicalities in this, but there's definitely very clear cut rules um, of what winning and losing is. And it's definitely not what is your whim on winning and losing. I want a piece of it. I want everyone to have ice creams that are the colors of the flag of Israel. It's not, that's not it, okay? You will be next. Yes. So this is your answer, okay? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, again, divide it into two separate um, answers. If you're talking to a child, you absolutely do not get into that with them. It's way over their heads. It's politics. And it's not necessarily something that they can even comprehend the terminology around. If you're talking to me as an adult, let's talk for four hours. I'll tell you all about it. I'll explain to you exactly what's happening legally, internationally, UN-wise, US-wise, what is the, the, the Navy of the US exactly defines and their objective of victory. We have a lot to talk about, definitely, but not to your kids. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you promise your child everything's going to be okay, have the sense of separating the collective we that are going to be okay and the individual we's that I cannot promise you those individuals are going to be okay. And that actually takes us to the last message. There's a message that you are all saying, except you're not saying it coherent enough. There's one message, and it's absolutely vital that this message would come across with conversations that you're having with your kids and your students. Come on, bring it up. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're strong. I'm, I'm happy to add resilience. 
we will survive. Yes, we have a lot to look forward to. There's something that. Yeah, we are loved, we are supported, we are loved, we have a lot to for the future. We're surrounded by support by other nations. We are a collective, we are strong. There's also another thing, I'm gonna tell you what it is. I am confused. I don't have all the answers, okay? Let that soak for a second. In the 80s, I was just telling that to the teachers of UJEB. Teachers in the 80s were actually got an instruct in Israel, they got an instruction that they would should prefer to lie rather to admit that they don't know the answer, okay? So if, uh, if you were, for example, um, I remember teaching, uh, uh, learning sociology, and my teacher accidentally said the word post-mortem instead of moratorium. We were studying about sociology, and moratorium is uh, when a teenager has the freedom to be whoever they wanna be. Post-mortem is a post-mortem operation. She mixed up the words. And I, I raised my hands and I told her, don't you mean moratorium? She said, no, 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 I meant postmortem. And I meant it. Please don't correct me, thank you. I can't get that image out of my head. I think that educators now, postmodern era, everything's a lot more you know, comprehensible. There's a lot more theories suggesting that a teacher should be a human being, right? and make mistakes and admit that they don't have all the answers. What's that? Absolutely. I, I would even write that down as not just I am confused, but I would say I am also, I'm also confused. I'm also sad, okay? So that, here's a message for you. I am also, whatever, confused, sad, worried. worried. Unsettled, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. So now we're talking about the question of what to say and how to say it, okay? I'm go we're gonna do a simulation. You're my daughter, all of you together, and I am your mommy, okay? And I'm coming to you and I want to, I want to use all of those tools. So what would a conversation look like? Okay, here's how it goes. Hi, so I, I know, I, I, I'm sure that you, you saw recently that I've been sad. Did you see that? Yeah, I know you have, because I didn't talk to you today. I'm so sorry. And I was on my phone this whole time. I'm really sorry. Can I tell you what happened? Because I really want to share it with you because I think that you're such a smart girl and you care so much, and I'm so proud of you for being so attentive to me, and I just wanted to explain to you why I've been the way that I am. So the reason why is because, you know, do you remember that I told you about the situation in Israel? Remember that I told you that there's baddies and that there's goodies? Well, I want you to know that I'm really concerned. I'm really concerned. You're concerned as well? Oh, good. Let's be Can we be concerned together for a second? Who are you concerned for? Oh, for Safta and for Eitan because he's now, he's a soldier and he sent you a photo of himself. Okay, what else you can, oh, I can see that you're a bit, are you a bit, um, are you a bit scared as well, right? I want to, I want to name her emotion. So I feel, I feel very helpless because I wish I was there to help them. I wish I was there to give Safta a really big hug. I wish, but I, I, I'm just not there. I'm here. It's a good thing that I'm here because I'm now with you and we're here together. Can I tell you something else? Do you know how strong Eitan is, my brother? He's so strong. I want to... It's not just him though, it's all of our army. Do you remember what our army is called? It's called the idea that's right. We are so strong. And sometimes when I'm scared and I feel sad, it really helps me to remember that. It helps me to remember that we're really, really, really strong. And those baddies, they're just, we're, they're just silly. They're not gonna win. I promise you that we're gonna be okay. Okay, we are going to be okay. This is gonna be really hard. We're looking, uh, it's gonna be a little bit of a hard time, but I promise you that it's gonna be okay. And do you wanna give me a hug? Yeah, let's get, let's, can you give me a hug? Cause I, I feel like I need a hug right now. Can you give me a hug? I know that I'm the mommy most of the times, but do you mind taking care of me for a second and helping me out? Yes, empowering them. So there's what I said and there's how I said it, okay? So it's, it's try to be with me on this for a second. This is a bit confusing. There is, saying a message of uncertainty confidently, okay? 
And then they're saying, uh, as opposed to that, let me give you an opposite example, saying a confident message, confused, right? So the way that you say it, how you say it, is as vital as what you say. If I was to say to you, um, look, we're obviously, we're, of course we're gonna win, but I, I, we're gonna win, but I don't, we're so strong. Like I don't, we, we I, I wouldn't come through because not because of what I said, because of how I said it. So as parents, as educators, we have an obligation of conveying a convincing message, okay? We need to plant safety and security. We need to anchor them. We need to be confident. We need to look at them in the eyes. We need to hold their hand. We need to physically have that, you know, that resonance of brain and body this full presence, you are present in this moment of telling the child that we, the Jewish people in the state of Israel, we, the circle we, are going to be okay. It doesn't contradict me being confused, okay? And it doesn't contradict me being sad, me having emotions. But when you say that, and when you ad admit that and empower them to feel those feelings because they're very normal and they show caring, when you say that, you have to be confident, okay? What you're doing right now is in very little words, very little time, validating their emotions, navigating their emotions through into sense-making, into safe shore. You're anchoring them. You are taking that role of an anchor in their lives. You're giving them this beautiful spectrum of emotions that from now on, they will be able to to verbalize their own emotions, communicate their own emotions. You're giving them a reassuring, reliable, positive, empowering message. And you're doing all of that for under one minute. Okay? Question. Yeah. Does this conversation have to do with something going on thousands and thousands of miles away? Thanks for coming, everyone. Don't feel bad if you need to get up and leave. I'm taking too much of your time. It's like a conversation with your child about what's going on over Israel very far away from us and which they know deep down actually doesn't affect them because we are here and we actually are safe but we actually don't know that they're safe here and there's a lot going on in the community and there's a lot of terrible noise coming out there that people are talking people saying terrible things mm -hmm. so what do we say to our children when they ask us questions or there is a conversation about going to certain events Actually, I'm not so sure whether or not it's safe or not. Mm. How much do we broach that with our children? How how honest are we with them? Yeah. Um, like, how do we deal with that? Is that okay? Very difficult. So I'm gonna I'm gonna t I'm gonna add to you, to to your question. Uh, I got a message on Facebook that on uh, WhatsApp, very disturbing message that um, uh, Ismail Hania, one of the leaders of Hamas in Gaza, put out. Uh, 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 declared the jihad against the Jewish people all over the world. So he's calling to Muslims to hurt Jewish people on October the 13th, which is tomorrow. Okay. Do you all know of this? Okay. So, okay. So here it's, it's happening. It's, it's, it's a real thing. It's a real message that has been taken out from Ismail Haniya. He got support from imams all over the world. He also got, uh, you know, he also got called out by other imams that said that this is in the way of Islam. We also got a lot of support from Saudi Arabia, for example, that condemning Ismail Haniya's words. Uh, however, he did say that. So that makes me feel unsafe. Yeah? I wasn't sure if it was actually in the same way. Jihad. Yeah, jihad is a holy war. No, but what, but was that, was that, did that, is that statement, did he make a statement? As, for as far as I know, he did. For as far as I know, it's a real thing that happened. Okay, I haven't seen him. Uh, but but the, the news uh, broadcasting services that uh, um, uh, spread it out this message are reliable sources. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. So the, the, the question that we're talking about right now is, are we safe here? That's the question, right? Um, there's this happening thousands of miles away from us, but why am I telling my children, um, are we safe here? It's a great question. 
Um, I'm going to go to Coalfield Park tomorrow to find out for myself if we're safe or not. Let me tell you what's not going to happen, okay? Definitely not going to take my kids because it's too late and they're going to be too sleepy and carrying them around with their crying is upsetting and I don't feel Zionistic when I'm carrying my child around. Um, let me tell you what's not going to happen. What's not going to happen is, uh, personally, I don't feel, as an educator and someone that uh, believes in this community, okay? I'm not going to read a title that says there's a jihad declared against Jewish people all over the world, and then I'm going to say, oh, okay, and get into my house and be sad. Here's how, here's how not to handle anti-Semitism, all right? Here's how yes to handle anti-Semitism. All of you should come tomorrow, and the police, uh, we need to trust the Australian police to take good care of us, and we're going to take good care of each other. And the more people come, the less likely it is for anything bad to happen, okay? Here, this is literally how anti-Semitism works. Yeah. Mm. Are you hearing the chuckling here? That's educators that know the backstage of that thing. Of that saying, it's ridiculous. It's it's a way of what? Yeah, it's it's a way of showing mistrust in your own in the, in the own students. Like, showing solidarity to. Yeah, for the younger kids. Yeah, I, I suppose I understand that, that, that judgment. I just, I just feel like that uh, I would love to know that the school simultaneously addressed their local parliament member and told them, we don't feel safe in our own communities. Yeah. I, I just want to add a couple of things just because of some other hats that I wear. Ever since the attack of Benaira, the French presence in Caulfield and Benaira has increased significantly. Um, our incidence rates of crime in Benaira are still lower than a lot of our directly surrounding suburbs. Um, I hear rumours that the Premier is coming tomorrow, so I'm suspecting if that is the case. So I'm, I'm but not... Can I please finish? Thank you. Um, I had a conversation with the Mayor of Benaira who's coming tomorrow, and we had that conversation. He's not Jewish. He's bloody not, you know, he's from Northern Ireland. Mm. He's been through a lot of direct, you know, violence for an extended period of time for his family before they got peace. Um, and he's coming tomorrow. Um, and we had that conversation about feelings of safety, and I enlightened him on a few things about the multi generational trauma and fear and why so many of us actually hide. Mm. Just, I said to him that I wouldn't have actually told anyone that I was Jewish the entire four years of my term if I hadn't have been outed by someone else. And he just, when we went through this whole conversation, there are levels of understanding about what the Jewish community goes through now that I've never been seen before in the Jewish, in the wider Australian community. Um, I've got a collection of uh, people reaching out, and you probably all do, from non-Jewish people, from yeah. past working through, are you okay? I've had someone offer to get my daughter on a flight to London from Israel, and apparently there are only diplomatic seats left. She says, I'll get you a diplomatic seat. You know, people are caring in a way and reaching out, um, and I think... It's really important to remember that, that we are actually probably better supported by the community we're in now than we've ever been in Australia. And mm. if we can't trust in them now, then we really, you know, where do we go next? Yeah, I'm going to add to that. Even if some politicians are going to come tomorrow, uh, it makes it even less likely for um, for yes. people to, to choose to hurt course. anyone. I just want to clarify that because I want to be said and not say we should not go in. We should say we should not go in. The Premier is going tomorrow. The Leader of the Opposition will be there at the Parliament. Beautiful. Security is not a problem. My question is, I, I'm i going, my son is going, my 17-year-old son begged my mother not to go, he is 17, he begged her not to go, and I just don't feel my 10-year-old should go. My question was, how do I 
My ten year old wants to come. This guy, he wants to come, doesn't he? Wants to come because because he feels like something's happening. Mm. I just want her to feel safe and know that. Mm -hmm. But I, you know what? I just, it's complicated. So yeah. How, how do you think you can make sure that? Yeah. So, whether or not uh, children under 15, whether or not they should go to the rally or not, I'm, I, I, I don't have a clear answer to that. It's not exact science. My children are not going. They're five and three. Definitely not going. Um, but children between, let's say, 10 and 15, it's, it's, it's a legitimate question. I actually don't know. Yeah, you have to make that choice. But how, how do, yeah, vocabulary. Let's do a simulation. You are my 10-year-old daughter, and I'm the mummy, and I want to hold a conversation with you, okay? And I want to use some of these tools, okay? Um, how have you been? Are you okay? What's, what's going on in school? I've, I've heard you, you, you saying that some of the kids made some comments. Um, how have you been feeling? Have you been feeling okay? Okay, I, I understand that you're obviously concerned. You're a smart girl, you know what's going on. I don't have to lie to you as if you're a baby. You know that there's war in Israel. Uh, you know what's going on. It's actually, I'm gonna be re really honest with you because I trust you to be able to understand this. It's actually a lot scarier than, um, than what it used to be in the past. Because I remember that there were wars in the past. You weren't even born yet, but there was the, uh, the Gulf War, the Lebanese War, the second Lebanese War. There was the Intifada. There was the second Intifada. And then there were eight operations in Gaza since uh, Netanyahu first burst to power. Oferet Itzuka, Mudanan, Tsukaitan, right? And this, I'm telling you for real, uh, this is a bit more tricky. This is a bit more complicated than it is now. So. Let me, let me give you an example of how it's more complicated because, again, I, I can see that I'm talking to a smart girl and you care so much. So you deserve to know. You deserve to know. Um, what's been happening is that not just the uh, people of the Hamas have been, you know, aggressive towards Jewish people. They actually got a lot of support from the same sect inside Islam all over the world. So a lot of Muslim people are all of a sudden saying, you know, really scary things about Jewish people. Um, so it's really important that we stay strong together. So you know that there's a lot of Jewish people uh, all over the world that are supporting Israel right now. I'm with them, you and I, we're together on this. Like we, we need to show that we are strong. We can't show weakness right now. Now is not the time. We need to support Israel. We need to support our people. And I need you to be on this with me. Today, I'm gonna go to that rally. I'm asking you not to come. Do you know why? Not because I don't believe that you're smart enough to understand, not because I don't think that it's important. It's super, super, super important. But right now, I actually don't know if it's safe enough. I, I, I'm not sure. So I'm sharing this with you because I trust you and I'm asking you to stay at home. Is that okay? Do you, is that acceptable with you? Okay, I'm glad you, I'm glad you understand me. I love you so much. And I would never ever, ever tell you to stay away from something that you care about doing because I can totally see that you have. Yeah. <laughs> Worry about you. Worry about me. Oh, my God. You're the best daughter in the world. I'm so lucky to have you. You, I can see that you care and you're concerned about me. But let me tell you something. Your mommy is a strong Zionist, and there's no way that I'm backing out just because someone said on the Internet, I'm going to go there. And I'm with not just me. It's, there's going to be like 800 people there. I'm going to go. I'm going to go, and I'm going to be strong, and I'm going to make you proud of me. Okay, deal? Can you give me a hug? Because I'm, I'm a bit nervous about tonight. Can you give me a hug? Thank you so much for supporting me. You're just, you're just the best. You're amazing. You're my partner. You're my partner in, in this situation. And I'm, I'm going to send you photos. Deal? Okay. More good news. You get to watch TV tonight. How awesome is that? Um, I said, if you stop by anyone, and I say, are you Jewish? You say no. If they say, are you a friend of Jewish? Do you know any Jews? You say no. And I felt sick having to tell my kids to denounce that oh, no. they're Jews. But a one on one child in the street mm -hmm. with a no child, have a kid, what do you say? Is that the right thing to do? Tell them to lie about who they are. So that's a question that on the micro level, I don't know to answer. I don't, I, I heard the, the most brilliant thing the other day. Um, in, my cousins are from France and they, they walk down the street and it happened to them way, 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 a million years ago. It was like the beginning of the 2000s. They're walking down the street and a few Muslim kids in Marseille, they came to them and was like, 
was that Jewish? Are you Jewish? And my cousin, brilliant thing, said to him, "Ani lo madaber tarfatit," and it just it just walked away. Very good. Brilliant, isn't it? I love that. Um, I don't know to answer that on a micro level. On a larger scale, judge, letting letting history judging this act, um, there is a, it's a very problematic message to tell a child co conceal your identity because someone is threatening you. It's basically telling them the saying that you're saying to them is, if you see a bully, then let them bully you and um, uh, just try to be as small as you possibly can to make it easier for them to bully you later down the road. Yeah, absolutely. This, this situation, clear cut case, walk away, whatever. Um, but how about, but how about at here, how about adding, to adding to that, don't confess that you're Jewish. How about write down that, that their license plate? How about write the, the symbol of which car, what color, exactly where it happened? How about take the initiative to call the police right there and then? How about before you start losing your head with adrenaline, record a message giving her those instructions will help it to make more sense when, she, when it's happening. When this thing is happening, your head doesn't work. There's no brain out there. It's only adrenaline to, to save your life. If you prepare your daughter and you tell her, listen to me very carefully. If this happens, you do one, two, three, four. Repeat after me. What did I say? What do you do? I want to hear you say that. I want you to tattoo that into your brain so that when your brain gets fuzzy with adrenaline, you act on, on instinct. Okay? How about telling her that? And then she can lie. That's okay. It's still Zionist to do. It depends on the age. He will thank you when he grows up. Yeah. So I think we've also got an yeah. opportunity here to so I've got I've got two kids at Halebury. Um they're probably a handful of little kids at the school. And from the very beginning when my son started first year starting the eight, and he comes from Brighton Seth where there is a lot of anti Semitism. And some of the year eight were anti Semitic and um we I stomped on it straight away and I told the teachers what was going on what was going on straight away and their response was it will not be tolerated mm. and they made that very clear to me. When this happened and he's been very safe at the school since then, it's you know, it, 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 it's been yeah, four years down the track to get up to the year twelve. Um, my daughter's had nothing. She started in year seven, her her friends have been mm. amazing or want to come to show up, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, very inclusive and understanding. So when this broke out, um, I sent a letter to um, the head of you know, girls and the head of Year 12 um, mm -hmm. coordinator and just explained how we're feeling in terms of how the kids are feeling after seeing everything play out on the weekend and um, being a minority at the school. Um, just hoping that there will be no no um, anti-Semitism popping their heads mm. up, getting it put in, and um, if so, I'm hoping that next year the, the school will have an adequate response. They won't right. be the most amazing letter back, just mm. total support. And um, when I heard about the social media ban, I told them. Also, I sent them the RDF video that had come out, which had a message on it, had you know, that 
a nice big fan of BBC so we can go and Snapchat and, and everything. And I said that and that went straight to the CEO of Halebu. Um, the CEO of Halebu um, said Frank Lee would be interested and get some advice on how to handle it at the school. Mm. So I think we can all do that. Use it as, a, <coughs> it as an opportunity yeah. to educate because they're just going on with the non-Jewish schools get a hearing what's going on but it's not affecting the it's it's an effect, it's affecting everybody but mm. it's not affecting the not it's affecting families mm. in non Jewish schools. Right. And they're just going on there every day while our kids are back in school. You know, are feeling unsafe and and, well, and they don't those know. questions. Exactly. If they don't know they don't know oh. and it's not because they don't care. They just no. don't know. So I think mm. yes, yeah, spread spread the message yep. in every non Jewish school, every I don't know, every forum that you have where there's non Jewish people on it, the friends of kids watch out for it. Let the parents know that your kids are not feeling safe and give the parents the speech to their kids and they all they all love your kids and they want to support and they want to support them. Hmm. It's about the school educating yeah. everybody in the forum. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so um, <coughs> <coughs> mm. So d demanding Condemnment, for example, from public uh, bodies like schools or like members of the parliament, it's absolutely legitimate way to, to act as a parent. And it's also um, very well within your range of responsibilities as an anchor to someone else's life to be demanding those things. So good on you. It's, it's a wonderful uh, and important tool. I kind of want to move on because we went off the rails. Our messages, keeping them as clear as possible, and we need to make it snappy because we have like no more time. Um, Number one, we are strong. It's a message that can be conveyed in a million different uh, frames and phrases, and there's a million different words to, be, to, to say the same thing. We are strong. There's also, I am also feeling confused. I am also overwhelmed. I am also sad. I am a human being. But it's important to remember, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. So even if you say something like, I am confused or I am scared, you need to say that with confidence. Even if you're saying a message, that the message might sound like it's a message that shouldn't be said to children, like I am scared, you're still anchoring them down to reality by saying this message with confidence. I am scared too, okay? Look at them in the eyes, hold their hands, don't stutter, be confident. And own the fact that that's what you're actually feeling, okay? Um, we are supported, okay? It's a beautiful and wonderful and efficient thing to do. To show, show your children images from around the world of um, iconic structures lit up in blue and white, like the Eiffel Tower uh, or the uh, stadium in Melbourne. Um, thanks for coming. Um, show them those images, right? If we're talking about stopping the slippery slope with bad images, how about offer them good images instead? How about uh, offering them reinforcing videos or in, in footages and you know, things that are actually uplifting, right? Instead, offer it to them, that algorithm will start to kick in and then you'll get more of them. It's a win-win situation, okay? So these are our messages, reliable, strong, being said with confidence, and you need to convey them as often as you possibly can in as many different types of ways as possible. Right. Oh, okay. So the, the uh, I always say the the sentence the Palestinians are also a victim of Hamas. I always I always say that it's it's proper advocacy to say that. <clears throat> uh, yep. Yeah. yeah, you can say that. Up uh, again, up to a certain age. So to my five-year-old, I definitely tell her there's goodies and baddies, for sure. Um, keeping it simple for her. It becomes more complex once the critical thinking system kicks in. And then if you draw a picture that is too simpl simplistic for, let's say, a 16, 17-year-old child, this kid that cares but is also intelligent, uh, then you're actually risking your integrity as someone that sees a um, not sim simplified image of reality. You need to be able to hold a discussion with an intelligent child that doesn't necessarily see uh, baddies and goodies, right? Have you seen the movie The Joker? 
that there is good and bad in the world. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I, if we had 12 hours to delve into the philosophical question of good and bad that has been existing since the dawn of time, I would have happily done that because it's a, such a slippery terminology. And I feel like if you, if you convey that, um, you are, you, you're sort of like, you're risking it down the road, down the road. Like maybe, maybe in two years, in, ten, in five years, you will find yourself being challenged by a young adult that all of a sudden sees that there are victims amongst those baddies and maybe bad is, uh, is a victim. Of, being good is, is uh, indirectly. I'm... Yeah, I agree with you in the terms of like opposing relativism or nihilism. There is good and bad in the world. There are good behaviors and there are bad behaviors. I, again, I'm just saying it's a very slippery... Uh, slippery term. Uh, there's a slippery philosophical discussion here to be held. Oh, that number one, it depends on the uh, on the 13 year old, uh, which 13 year old is it? How intelligent is he? How good is he in, in those things? I did that be way before I was 13. I did that in, in, in elementary school. Like I I advocated for my party, my my whatever. Um, the, the question is uh, not necessarily can he do that is how are you going to stop him from doing that? Peers in this age are the biggest anchor in a child's life. Y you are not as powerful in a child. So again, I don't know you, but typically speaking, 13, 14, 15 year old kids rely on their peers as an anchor way more than they rely on their parents. They learn everything from their peers, from their treating their own body to sexuality, to their political opinions, to what groups they're listening to, to what food they like, to what clothes to wear. They are way more significant than you. You you bet that they would somehow convey their political opinions or their identity, their political, and ethnic and religion identity to their peers. For sure, he will do that. If, if your question is, is it okay to send them? You don't have any control over that. He's going to do that no matter what. Yes. Yeah, you can help him with uh, coming up with the right message, just like we did here. Is this accurate enough? No, let's think about another word. Like, is this coherent enough? What if he tells you this? If you have a thinker and a carer, you want to challenge them. You want to open up the whole world to them. Teach him, teach him how to research. What, where to look for valid information, where not to look. What is a superficial, the kid needs to learn rhetorics. They need to learn advocacy. You need to challenge them on this one. I would but, say, I would say, I would probably do a reverse of your approach to explain the situation. And I'd, I'd ask them around and say, what do you tell your girls when you ask this question? What would you want to tell them? Yeah, beautiful. And hear from them what they want to say, you know? Um, when I'm approached about things that are, um, you know, politically related, I say, that I'm not, I'm not the most politically um, minded, so I'm not the best person to ask, but this is my, my opinion. You know? So that's the kind of thing I would probably say to my child is, if they're not that okay with the situation and they're not comfortable with advocating for something that they don't really um, know the ins and outs about. So this is this is kind of what mm. it's about, but you know, I can't say that I'm that close to it. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. The good news is that pretty much the whole, uh, d- this let's call it a debate uh, between Palestinians and Israel, there's nothing that hasn't been said. So it's a pretty pre-written scenario that everyone just keeps saying everywhere in the world. So they do that in universities and they do that in, you know, whatever, public speaking. Everyone has the same claims, and there's the same answers, and then there's the same questions that are being brought up and the same attempts to tackle, and then there's the same facts that are always being brought up. It's very much a generic discussion. So if you give your kid one time the whole shebang, the whole package, he can do that a million times. Um, there are, I'm, I can actually help you with that. I have, um, I have one document of messages that are pro-Israeli and anti-Hamas, not anti-Palestinian, by the way, anti-Hamas. Let's differentiate those two bodies, okay? Um, and it, I send it to you, it's like, it's uh, up to 20 words, st- goes like an arrow straight into someone else's brain. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's like rhetorics at its absolute best. How do I send it to everyone here? Sure, no problem. I'm happy to do that. Okay, we're gonna move on to this. So uh, we're gonna delve a little bit into philosophy here, okay? So here's your child, okay? Your student, or even you, and there's black clouds surrounding us. And that flag is terminology, it's words, literally in words. So there's war, kidnapped, helplessness, there's Palestinians, you know, evil atrocities. There's a lot of really bad words. Philosophically speaking, this is what's what we call an ontological saturation. Ontology is the is the it's the logic that teaches us about the importance of word. What is a word? What does it do to us to hear a word and then there's an image in our heads? So what happens to you if you hear the same word a million times? Something happens, your brain gets fixated on the same images. So if you're surrounded by let's say you're a kid and you're surrounded by the word um, strength, uh, men, uh, brother, um, uh, daddy, you know, whatever. You're surrounded by whatever, uh, chauvinist terminology, then you would be a little bit less likely to develop a feminist upbringing, okay? So ontology, it teaches us that the words that are that we are saturated around, that are, that we are saturated with are kind of working like oxygen okay so we're breathing in those words and we have those images in our heads and then something happens to us something that we don't even know that is happening to us and that's something is that we're getting into a specific and into a certain state of mind around these words okay so here's another beautiful tool for you as educators make yourself a list of good words to saturate the room with so those words can be strong Okay, those words can be prevail. Here's a good, that's a good one. Prevail. Um, Is it AI? I don't know. Prevail. Um, um, What else? I I personally use the, uh, the word Zionism quite a lot today with my kids. Um, Just saying it. And it doesn't, here's the trick, here's the magic. It doesn't have to be in any context whatsoever. Okay, it doesn't have to be in the context of, you don't even have to talk about Israel. You're, my daughter could be making cookies. You are such a strong baker. You make the most amazing cookies. That, that's a very, you really, really won this, this task. What a victory era is. You didn't know how to make cookies just two seconds ago. Now look at your amazing cookies. You're an unbelievably strong human being. You superstar. It's a win, victory, yeah? So, right, well, the, the word that I'm using is saturating the air with. It's kind of like you're, you're painting the air with a specific color, like a brighter color. And then this is what the child sees. So they don't know that this terminology actually affects them philosophically, psychologically. They don't know that now they are saturated with positive, reinforcing, empowering words, but they are. I've been doing to this to you guys since the beginning of our meeting. I kept saying those words, empowering, victory, right? And I say that with conviction. And the atmosphere here is very up, right? Do you remember 
how you were feeling when you first walked into this room. Now you're feeling better, aren't you? You don't even know why. And so here's why. The reason why is because I kept saying up, uh, uplifting, empowering, victory, Zionism, IDF. It's literally just using those words in any possible context. And it doesn't matter what. And if you say that with enough conviction, you're literally saturating the air with a positive ontology. So if you want to sound smart when you're talking about this, just use the word ontology, okay? Until I'm gonna give you a great example of ontology. Do you know how I know that God exists? Do you know how I know? Because we're talking about him right now. That's how I know. That's why I know that God exists. If God didn't exist, there would be nothing to talk about, okay? So what we are talking about and the way that we're talking about it, the words that we're using hold immense power, power over us, okay? And if we want to, to win this task, we need to use every single tool in our arsenal and ontology is one of them, okay? Unbelievably powerful. It's, it's again, one of those magics of humanity. Um, we've spoken about... Yes, they're sa literally saturating you with images that. No, a lot now. now. They've got Israel. How much time do we have? Israel, Gaza. We don't have time. Five minutes? The order they do them though tells you what the message is. Oh, the questions. Depending whether it's with Gaza or Israel. Okay. Um, so for one minute, I'm going to finish this and wrap up, and then I'm going to do the, some questions, okay? If uh, I, I believe most of them I sort of answered already. Um, so we've done peer effects. I, I want to give you another beautiful tool, and it's called hand, heart, brain, okay? So we already spoke about know, and we spoke about feel, okay? We spoke about this axis of the knowers and the feelers. Now I want to talk about doers, okay? Uh, there isn't a study about anxiety or depression that doesn't support the finding that action is actually the best form of therapy that you can offer to someone that is either depressed or anxious. Any type of feeling of helplessness can be resolved by two things, support, like a support network, oxytocin, and action, endorphins, okay? Sorry? Get moving, Get moving exactly. Um, so... We're just gonna add a hand to that equation of brain and heart. It doesn't matter what, that's the trick. It doesn't matter what, it could be the, the littlest thing. Take a picture of yourself holding a flag of Israel and uh, with the hashtag, we stand with Israel. Write a letter to uh, a pen pal in Israel and send it to them via email. Uh, let's write a song together. Let's write a song about how much we, we support uh, our people, how much we, we condemn bad things from happening, how much we hate bullying, even if it's, a people against another people, okay? Um, let's uh, do a bake sale and let's get $200 for Anat's brother on the border of Gaza to finally get proper food. Um, let's do, let's uh, sell bracelets, uh, blue bracelets. Here we are. Every single bracelet, we're gonna get $5 from every person that buys that bracelet and then that, that money we're, we're gonna send to rebuilding Faraza or whatever. There's a million things that you can do. And it doesn't matter how little or how big what you do is. It doesn't matter. Soon as you do something, you start that beautiful positive feedback loop of, I did something, I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of myself, I'm feeling energetic. I'm feeling energetic, I'm gonna go and do something, okay? Positive feedback loop. Very well known in psychology, very well supported in every single research and every single discipline. If you do that, just do one thing with them, it will get them that exhilarated feeling of um, helping. It will get them out of helplessness. So quite typically what we're talking about is doing this to them. Beep. Going up, up the slope, okay? We're uplifting their spirits and we're getting them to, we're getting them start feeling better feelings, okay? So hand, heart, brains. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up, okay? We spoke about the rainbow of emotions. Everything is normal. Even if your kid is feeling like they're in an action movie and it's kind of like cool to them, that's perfectly normal. We don't judge 
feelings, never, ever, ever. Even if those feelings are being cynical, even if those feelings are, I don't care. We, we never judge feelings, okay? Later down the road, we can sort of catalog them. We can, we know our kids, we know that some of them are thinkers and some of them are feelers. And we need to find exactly what, how to meet every single one of them. What is the proper response for them, the educational response? This kid, we want to challenge, we want to pull them in. This kid, we want to help them to st stimulate them intellectually and give them answers. This kid, maybe we just want to leave them alone. And this kid, we're going to just remind them how strong. This is the message for this kid. We are strong. This, that's it. That's the message. Okay. <clears throat> we want to really make sure to remember our role in those kids' life. We are an anchor to those kids. I'm sorry. My apologies. But you don't, we as a community, we don't have that beautiful privilege of lying down in bed and crying ourselves to sleep and scrolling through videos and filling our heads with the depressing thought. Sorry, we have a job. We have children. We need to take care of our children. And our community needs us now more than ever. So I've been seeing quite a lot in the last four or five days, people walking around and, uh, you know, moping and wanting to talk about their feelings. And Get, snap, you got your 48 hours of grieving. That's perfectly legitimate. I'm not judging the fact that that's what you're feeling. I am judging the fact that you're stuck there. And I'm asking you to uh, get up, get yourself out of it, and remember that you have a job to do and there's a lot to be done. Um, we are an anchor to other people. We are an ingredient in the community resilience and we have responsibility. Um, we are also responsible of navigating our children into safety in terms of their emotions. We are responsible for their future. We don't want that to stick as a collective post-trauma with our children. One of the ways to do that is to name their emotions. The reason why is because it bypasses that chaos and it creates, it makes sense. It's, it's, Sense-making is a very powerful tool in stopping chaos in our heads, okay? So we want to name their emotions. It is magic. Please try that and contact me back and say thank you because it works. Also, another thing that we want to do very responsibly is to stop our children from that slippery slope of depression and PTSD via social media. We don't have any control over social media or over that era of information. There's a lot of uncontrolled and unsupervised information, triggery, anxious provoking. We don't want our children to have access to them. The best way to handle it, if your kids are under 10, turn off the TV and take the phone away. Literally, do the responsible thing and do that. If your kids are over 10, hold a responsible conversation with them eye to eye. Tell them that it's the responsible thing to do. Okay? We do want, this is what the no, what the yes, we want strong, responsible, reliable, empowering messages. We want those messages to be true, not false, not manipulative. And we want those messages to stick. So we want to say them as often as we can. And we want to say them with conviction. So those messages are, we are strong. We being a collective. We are supported. Here's the proof. The United States send uh, their Navy to the coast of the middle. Blah, 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 blah. Here's the proof. I'm also confused. I'm also sad. I need you to also support me. That is an unbelievably empowering thing to do to your children. I need you to give me a hug. I need you to give me a kiss. I'm concerned about stuff that whatever. I'm also sad. And we have a lot to look forward to. Okay. What so, I would just say you're you're so right. I can I can hear that you're confused. I can hear that you're confused. I feel confused as well. In fact, I'm so confused with what's going to happen the next day. It's actually frustrating. I'm, I'm frustrated. I feel helpless. I can't control my own future. And this is... I think it's the same. It's the same thing. You can't control that, but you have to worry or you don't have a worry. You don't say, you're having to feel bad. You have to worry about your future. You have to control that. Yeah, absolutely. You can't worry about it because you can't control that. Well, I would say I'm also confused. Yeah, you're you're right. You, you want to give that your daughter validation. You're absolutely right. Everything that you're saying right now, my daughter, you're, you're right. I feel the same thing. Let's think together. What, what are we, you and I going to do about it?
if a child is able to understand, this is the point I want them to say, you can never do it. That means that you could never have it. Yeah, and absolutely. That, that, you realize that, that you actually Ooh. put yourself through things that never, oh, that never happened to you. You, you actually lived through them as if it happened. <laughs> so, best, best to take all the worries and all the anxiety you have because otherwise you never do yeah. Yeah. I might add for a younger child, I'd probably take that one second to say because it's as you said, it's you know, there's so many things that's so confusing. I'm just gonna focus on today. And yeah. then tomorrow yeah, yeah. and tonight we'll focus on tomorrow. So just narrow it back down. Yeah, again. it's it's that would be a good message to say to either one of those. Absolutely. Let's focus on today. Yeah, beautiful. What could use your imagination for the good things that can happen or angels? Yeah. So there's I, I there's a Buddhist um tale about uh, every person has two wolves living inside of them. Do you know the tale? Two wolves. One of them um is uh, the wolf of hatred and fear, right? And the other one is courage and love. Uh, and the two wolves are fighting each other. Which one of them is going to win? What's the answer? The one that you feed. Beautiful. Um, all right, just quickly finishing up. Did somebody want to say something? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, uh, 100%, just one step before that. Remember that those questions, the what ifs are coming from this state of mind. They're coming from a very cluttered state of mind. They're coming from a, this state of mind, that ontological cloud of scariness. And, and you, right now you need to go back to this. You need to go back to, there's a storm. My daughter's in the middle of a storm. I need to take her on board the ship with me and I need to navigate her to safety first. Before I resolve the problem, before I answer as a professional, I need to validate her emotions and I need to name them, okay? I need to give her, listen, you have no idea how powerful this thing is. Validating a child's emotion and naming those emotions is magic in, in, in progress, okay? You see it happening right in front of your very eyes. You gain their trust, you give them space, it 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 makes you closer together, you and your child, okay? And it navigates them into safety by enabling the cortex to start working over the endocrine system. It literally takes them out of the evolutionary survival adrenaline cortisol system, and it enables their brain to work. Once your child is in safe shores and you can see that their brain is working because they're making sense again, now you can talk about what happens later. Okay, but the question what if is coming from uncertainty, which my interpretation is chaos going on up there. So first navigate them to shore and then continue the conversation. Okay, so we're here and we want to stop that slippery slope. We want to responsibly stop our children from watching literally horror movies that are reality. Um, we also want to saturate them with positive, empowering words of victory and winning. It doesn't have to be in a context. Uh, you can just write flashcards and give it, uh, it doesn't matter. Make a poster. I did a, uh, for my kids, you know the the uh, Coles superhero collection? You know what I did with them? I actually collected them with like like a fanatic. And I made a little poster for my kids of all of the superheroes. And I just write down like, you're a superhero. And then we go through the superheroes and we tell uh, what every superhero superpower is. And I just keep telling them, superhero, superpower, power, strong, they're the good guys, protection. It's it's just a lot of those where it doesn't have to be in a specific context. We're talking about on, ontological saturation, okay? We also have peer effect, remembering that their friends are unbelievably powerful being in your kids' lives, and they are probably as strong of an acre an anchor as you are if your kids are 13 or over probably more um and we have the hand heart and brain which means integrate an action doesn't matter how small doesn't matter how big any small action 
to get your kids' positive feedback loop rolling. Now this makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, here's a question. We don't have time, do we? One question. What What is appropriate to say to a child living here with a concept? Of, oh, with no concept. Yeah, that, I answered that. Um, looking to create a sense of scale and resilience. I don't know. know. And it's just so hard for their minds to comprehend with limited information. But if they come across questions without us. Okay. But what if they come across questions without us? So what if your children have questions without you? Um, and then you're not around them. So I would definitely, everyone, 100% of you should go to your children. And if you're a teacher and you have Jewish children, you should tell them the following statement, okay? I know that uh, you're all, most of you are aware of what's been happening. Maybe you've seen that I'm a little bit distressed and upset as well. I want you to know something, okay? I want you to know that I am here for you. And yes, I'm, I don't have all the answers. I'm only a human being. But I, I, I do want us to be strong together. Everything that you're feeling is 100% normal, and I want to help you to go through that. So if you have any questions, if you want anything, do you have anything to say, please, I want you to come to me, and I want you to tell me what your question is, and I promise you that whatever it takes, we're going to figure out the answer together, okay? Give them that speech. 10 seconds, and you're covered. Thanks so much for coming. Zoom. Zoom.